Hi, welcome to the Career Refresh Podcast. I'm your host, Jill Griffin. I'm a former media and marketing executive turned career strategist and executive coach. I spent my career working my way up and through the ranks of global organizations and startups, and today I show others how to do the same. Join me each week as we discuss the strategies and actionable steps to leverage your strengths, increase your confidence, and develop your career well-being. Ready? Let's do it. Hey, friends, this is Jill Griffin, the host of The Career Refresh. This week, I am introducing you to Rashad Tabakawala, business strategist, thought leader, author, futurist. I mean, just grab your notes app now, get a pen. You're going to want to write down a lot of the things that he's talking about. My career has been nurtured and shaped by many impactful leaders, but Rashad Tabakawala sits at the top. I first met him in 1999 when he was leading what is now the Publicis Group through a transformation where he co-created, nurtured, and led numerous digital business units. And friends, listen, finding leaders within your company that you admire, that help you see the vision, stay engaged, stay motivated, stay connected, drive impact, you want to find those people. Rashad has always been one of those people for me. Rashad is a business strategist, thought leader, and the author of Restoring the Soul of Business, Staying Human in the Digital Age. It was published by Harper Collins. He is also working on his second book, Rethinking Work, which will be published by McGraw-Hill and is expected out in mid-2024. You have to follow his substack. The future does not fit in the containers of the past. And listen, he puts this out for free every Sunday, and this is read by over 25,000 leaders worldwide. Rashad most recently was the global strategist and chief growth officer of the 100,000-person marketing and business transformation company, The Publicist Group. He has been named by Business Week as one of the top business leaders for pioneering innovation, and Time Magazine dubbed him as one of the five marketing innovators. In this episode, we discuss, going way back, how his degree in advanced mathematics led to a career in business transformation and innovation, where he gets his inspiration from, how to leverage practical tools and that we must do this to stay relevant, how to tell truth to power within your organization, and how inspiring authors can rethink the math and model of content monetization. If you are in this space, whether it's Substack or writing a book, he drops a lot of wisdom here. We also talk about how to reinvent while being a thoughtful content machine and the difference between jobs and work, and a gig economy. And listen, as we are working longer and staying healthy longer, we need to be rethinking the span of our career. And that is about staying relevant, creating resilience, and working your mind. This conversation is delivered with clarity and humor, and it is such an honor to present Rashad Tabakawala on The Career Refresh. So friends, if you have questions, send them to me. I know he would love to answer them. Hello, at jillgriffincoaching.com. And as always, dig in, stay inspired, and I'll see you next time. Hi, Rashad. Welcome. I'm so excited. I finally get to talk to you. Well, Jill, it's great to reconnect uh, for all these years, though we have been lurking, you know, online around each other. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So for our listeners, you were in for a treat today. Um, I had the privilege of working with Rashad and working in the organization Publicis, which you'll probably hear touched on throughout our conversation today for many years. And he has always just been not only an inspiration of uh, leadership, but also an inspiration of transformation, resiliency, and relevancy. And that's a lot of what we're going to touch on today. But before we get there, I want to ask you to go way back I know you grew up in Bombay, India. I know that you received a degree in economics and advanced mathematics from the University of Bombay. And then when you came to the U.S., we had our MBA at the University of Chicago. But I want to ask you, like, 
was that an intended path or did it just sort of unfold to you? Like, how did you get and figure that out for yourself? Sure. So, you know, I think there were a few things. One is that I did grow up in India and I loved, uh, my parents loved reading. I love reading. And I initially wanted to be a writer. Mm. Uh, and my parents basically, who obviously loved reading and they were good writers, uh, basically uh, suggested that um, I had nothing to say. They said, look, even though you might know how to write well, you've got really nothing to say. So it's not just you can write well. you got to have something <laughs> to say. You don't have a lived experience. Um, and the other is everywhere in the world, this is true in India, but everywhere in the world, you know, you're not going to be able to, unless you're very, 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 very lucky, you're not going to be able to like make a living as a writer. So instead, why don't you do something that will help you think? So mm. why don't you do mathematics? Mm. How did you okay. feel about that? So my whole stuff is like, I hate math, <laughs> uh, but my parents basically said, well, you got a choice. You don't want to be a doctor, which we completely agree. Um, and, you know, if you're not a doctor or an engineer, then besides math, almost everything else you study won't actually leave you with much. And so India wasn't big on like, uh, in, in, Indian orientation was preparing you for a job. So, you know, liberal arts was not actually something taught in college or it was, it, this, this was 40 years ago. It was, you know, and this was true 40 years ago. It's not true today. It's more what ladies would do who mm -hmm. weren't going to go working, right? right? All that's changed obviously completely. Yeah. So it was like, no, 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 you have to do something that actually prepares you to get a job, not that, right? So they said, you want to, okay, you want to expand your mind. Good way to expand your mind is to expand your mind through math. So that's what I did. And it was high math, two years of just math. So my four years of college, the final two years were only math. Oh, gosh. <laughs> and, and I did actually pretty well. Uh, and... I've forgotten all of it, but it made me think in different ways. It basically made you analytical, logical, you know, looking at things from different perspectives. Uh, and, and then I got interested in business. So I said, okay, I'm going to go to business school. Mm. And the reason I ended up at the University of Chicago was, again, because of a thing with my parents. So my father had come to the University of Chicago for his MBA in 1950s. And... I was fortunate I got into Chicago, I got into Wharton, I got into some of these really good schools. And I decided to go to Chicago because at some particular stage, it was both continuing sort of the legacy. But he had a lot of friends in Chicago. And he said, you're going to be there by yourself in the US. You've never lived outside. You might as well be in a city which I know people. So if something things go wrong, you can like reach out to people and they can show you the city and things like that. And so I came here and I froze my ass off. <laughs> uh, you know, it was the worst winter when I came in. Um, and, and, and that is how that started. Now, up to there, I don't know whether it was like planned. I wanted to be a writer. I ended up doing math. Okay. I did want to do business while I was doing that. And I did end up at a business school. Uh, so, you know, the, the early years, I would say were very influenced by what my parents thought, uh, so in India, you tend to respect your elders and I had great parents. So they weren't like forcing me, but okay. they said, Hey, listen, listen to us. We, you know, we have masters in arts too, but we, we have liberal degrees, but we also have MBAs and we have law degrees and we're all for your, you know, liberal arts stuff, but you'll do that because you're passionate about it. You'll read books. You'll still keep going at that. This is the other stuff to do. So that's how it started. Um, and then, the reason I got into, and then when I was studying, when I came out of college or uh, graduate school, I had three constraints. Uh, constraint number one was these were the, in the 1980s, I was one of very few Asian students coming out of business school. So there were two Indians in my class. I was one of those, right? If you include Asians, so not Europeans, but Asians, there may be 12 of us in the class and the class had maybe two, 300 students, oh, right? Wow. So 5% of the class was Asian, 95% was not. 
And most of the 95% was Caucasian with probably 70% US and 25% Europe. Uh, and uh, so the school wasn't set up and most of the Europeans were going to go back to Europe. Oh. And the Asians would like to hang out here. Uh, okay. But companies were not hiring people who did not have work visas. And at that time, Chicago hadn't set up thinking about anything for their five, 10 Asian people. So I came out of school with almost no one willing to interview me, excepting one company broke its rules to interview me, which is Leo Burnett, the advertising agency. Oh, there it is. And, right. And it was the one company that interviewed me and the one job I got. Wow. Okay. So for all the stuff, I had an MBA, I was doing really well, but guess what? You don't have a green card, luck's yeah. out. Okay. Now, the good news is I wanted to work in the world of advertising because I decided that I didn't know enough about American culture. And in those days, Leo Burnett was a marketing strategy firm and an advertising firm. So in the 1980s, uh, clients did not have marketing departments. The marketing departments were the agency. And advertising was so powerful that it was the driving force. So advertising and distribution was how you build stuff. Get distributed in Walmart or places and advertise. That's how you built your brand, right? You had three networks, a few magazines. That's the way you did it. Uh, and so I, and Bennett had 32 clients, world-class clients, Kellogg, Procter & Gamble, McDonald's. Uh, they had one office, which is Chicago was their headquarters. It was the only office they had. It was, they were the largest agency in the United States, but they operated out of Chicago, not New York. And they operated out of one building and they were privately held, right? Uh, and they flew people first class because United was one of our clients. So it was like, <laughs> like even, if you're, even if you're an assistant account executive, I said, this is a dream job. Here we go. And I started. <laughs> and I thought, okay, you know, in three, four years, I'll get my green card. And I'll go and see what other jobs exist. So somewhere along, we moved into the Leo Burnett building, which is a big building in, in downtown Chicago, 35 S. Wacker. And now it is uh, 41 years later and my key card still works for the Leo Burnett building. <laughs> okay. And, and so my old stuff for all the best laid plans, I ended up staying in exactly the same place. Okay. But the last time my business card, and, and, and I'm in fact no longer even a publicist employee, I'm more like an emeritus person, but uh, I have key card and parking privileges. So my key card still works. My email still works. Um, <laughs> And people said, like, have they forgotten to disconnect? And I said, no, they have not forgotten to disconnect it. It's kept connected. <laughs> they automatically disconnected. They had to decide not to disconnect it. Um, but uh, so that's that's where, you know, I've it's sort of ended started. up. Uh, but yeah. the last time my card said Leo Burnett was 1993. So, you know, I stopped working full time in 2019 at Publicis, uh, stopped being an employee in 2019. But between 1993 and 2019, while I was in the Leo Burnett building, I wasn't working for Leo Burnett. Right. Right. That's and so that's, that's the, that's so not. that was, that was when we launched, uh, we launched an interactive agency called Giant Step. I helped the team spin off Leo Burnett Media into Starcom. We then merged with another company called Media West and the publicist group bought us. Then I worked in digital transformation. I ended up chairing companies like Digitas and Razorfish. Then I built, then became the strategy person. We bought other companies and then at the very end, I was basically working globally as the chief strategist and growth officer, spending time between Chicago, New York, and Paris, um, though still, you know, living in Chicago. Uh, and that's... Uh, that's coming okay. up for me, just as you're saying that that's so crazy. So I, I met you in 1999. Yeah. You had just launched Starcom IP. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was in the New York office right. um, trying to do the same. And just that ride, I mean, the influence you've had over building so many companies and really shaping what today is the duh factor, like, oh, everybody does digital. But back then you were at the forefront, not only building companies, but taking large brands who were quite fearful of like, I want to try it, but what's this thing? TV is safe, print is safe. So yes. really at the forefront. Yeah, and there were, there were two or three things. In fact, today, you know, when people, like one of the key things I'm sure your listeners are grappling with, and this is a key thing we can sort of talk about, you know, um, people sort of people sort of ask me from time to time, they basically say, you know, like, it's been 40 years since you started or 42 years since you started. Uh, how have you managed to stay relevant? 
Okay. Because that's the key thing that they asked. They said, like, you grew up and you basically built a case 42 years ago for the fact that there'd be a new media called cable television. But not knowing that. <laughs> right. So, so literally, I went, said this cable television, then we eventually brought Ted Turner in and we said, look, you should think about things like CNN to the open media people, Right. And recently I was giving presentations to boards on generative AI and Web3 and things like that. And so people said, wait, how did that happen, right? And so I said, like, that's the key thing that we have to recognize is the world keeps changing and twisting and transforming, right? And the day we stop learning, we start becoming irrelevant. It's not we decide to stay relevant or not. If you stop learning, you become irrelevant. If you keep learning, it doesn't matter if you become seasoned like you and I, you can still be relevant. So that's a really good transition. So Rashad's book is Restoring the Soul of Business, Staying Human in the Age of Data. I'm going to put all the information in the show sure. notes. So you can grab a copy, either a hard copy or you know a link to Kindle. The idea, like your book talking about business transformation, global upheaval, and that, as you just said, how to stay relevant... I look at relevancy as both being a mindset and action, right? Meaning you may need to actually learn some things and stay on top of things. And it's a mindset. And what I hear so often from people as they're getting into their 40s is saying like, how do I stay relevant when the next group of people is coming up behind me? So what would you say to someone who's saying like, so what do I do? Like, what are the actionable steps I need to take? So there are a few things that I suggest that they're both, you know, in the book. And remember, one of the things I eventually did get to do what I wanted to do. Remember, I started this by saying I wanted to be a writer. <laughs> I was going to say, and now so you're here I was. I've written one book. I'm writing a second book. I write a sub stack. So Your I said, sub-stack okay. stack is amazing, which will also, Thank the future does not fit into the containers of the past. Yeah. I, the yeah. And, 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 and I was read by about 30,000 executives every Sunday. Okay. Uh, and, and it's free. So and it it's, and it's all opt-in. It's opt-in and it's free. But people say, like, you send it to anybody. I said, no, you have to, like, sign up. I'll tell people yeah. about it, but you got to sign up. I don't send it to people. Um, and, uh, like, you know, sight unseen. Um, so the, the, the thing that, the answer to that question is the following. Uh, the three very important ways of looking at it. So the first is the day that you should allocate one hour a day to learn. Because the only reason you feel that there's a next generation coming up is because you think the next generation knows stuff that you don't know. What prevents you from knowing stuff that they know? Okay. So my whole stuff is like, what made you think that you couldn't know that? Okay. Now, the other one is, but they're more comfortable and they're more adept with these particular tools because they've grown up with it. And Rashad, you grew up with typewriters and not Excel spreadsheet. So what's the deal? So I said, okay. I don't have to be an expert at Excel spreadsheet and pivot tables to understand how Excel spreadsheet works. Okay, I do a little bit of Excel spreadsheet. One doesn't have to be like an Excel jockey to basically understand that. But while yes, I may not be native fluent in that, what I have done over the years, which everybody in their 40s or 50s and 60s have, is we have also found a thing called experience. Hmm. And the experience allows us to both look at patterns in unusual ways that people don't see, have a sense of perspective, have a better sense of a point of view. And yes, from time to time, we have to unlearn. And so the patterns we see may not be as relevant today, but it helps. And so my basic belief is, one is if you keep learning and also recognizing that your years of experience also are a form of learning is one. The second one, and this is the one which is sort of tied to the unlearning, but it's something where people of my, you know, I'm much older than the 40s. I'm now 63, right? But people in their 40s who are, say, seasoned 20 years into the, I call, you know, seasoned people. I don't call them old or aging or senior. I just say, look, you're seasoned. Uh, Mm -hmm. So you're more seasoned. Um, And as you're more seasoned, The big issue at some particular stage is you get into a rut of ways and without knowing it, you found yourself in a routine and you aren't actually thinking you're following a routine. Mm. So the second thing I say is once in a while, build a case of the exact opposite of what you are doing and what you're thinking, right? So you call that refreshing. I call that reinventing, okay? 
which is okay, or rebooting or renewing or whatever it is. But the whole idea is, hey, I got to think about now. You can rethink about your life that way, but you can also rethink about easier things, which is like, why am I thinking this perspective is right? Why am I believing this person is right? Why do I think this is the right approach? Is Could there be another approach, right? Mm. Why could my recommendation not be right? So the suppleness. So one is, think about the learning as content, right? Think about this other thing as muscle, right? So the content is the food. And then the muscle is like, okay, you need the food, but then you need to have like sort of the muscle, which becomes interesting. And the third one, to your point, is there's this combination of content and muscle, but then the third part of muscle is action, Mm. which is actually do something, people, right? (laughs) So don't just think about it, fret about it, and learn about it, or even build the case the exact opposite, but at some particular stage, you want to do it. So I'll give you an example, a very simple example of how I did something recently over the last three years, which we've talked about, but I do this often and you don't have to do it all the time, but this is something that happens. So the people say, okay, what the hell do you learn about? Okay. So I said, look, there are two ways. The one way of thinking about it is whenever I come across something in the newspaper, magazines, I'm at meetings and someone's telling me something and I hear this stuff again and again, and I have no clue what they're talking about. I write it down and say, okay, what's that? Right. And then I get up in the morning and I, you know, open the library of Alexandria, which is called either a Google browser or YouTube or today maybe GPT and ask the stupid question. What are these idiots talking about? Okay. And then I do some research. So what happened is some time ago, I just three, three and a half years ago, three, middle of it, three and a half years. I just published my book. So I said, I'm now a writer. So I shall now think about what writers do. And I was seeing some really great writers leaving their jobs, their day jobs, you know, whether they were newspapers or magazines, and they were going to business for themselves. So I said, this is very cool. What the hell are they doing? And they were all used the same term, substack, substack, substack. So I said, what the hell is a substack? So I did research. So my learning hour thinking, right? Learning new stuff, I learned about Substack. And Substack is basically a content management platform, an email delivery platform, and a billing platform available for free. All you need to do is know how to type. So I said, okay, that's interesting. Now, these people were basically charging $5 a month or $60 a year, and were building a business, but you don't have to charge. So I said, okay, I'd like to learn. So that was my whole first thing was, okay, I've now learned about Substack, which is learning. Then the second is, I've just published a goddamn book. Ain't that good? But then I started thinking about, could the future of books be Substack and not books? Hmm. Okay. Because I said, hey, listen, I'm not doing it this way because I'm not charging. But I did, my book took, the whole book process took 21 months. Okay. okay. Because you have to write, I, and I did, the, I did it in an old-fashioned way. So I wrote a book proposal, got an agent, the agent sold it for an advance to a major publishing house. I had a year to write it. And then we had like five, six months of editing, mm. right? And then production. The whole thing took about two years. Uh, and obviously I was given an advance, but the, they took a risk. Um, and at the end of it, the book sold well. But for every dollar that the book sells, I get 25 cents and HarperCollins got 75 cents, right? Right. On Substack, I don't have to wait two years to write. Right. If I decided to charge, I keep 90% of it, and Substack gets 10% because they have a 10% fee. Right. Right? I have a direct relationship with my readers. I know who their names are because I have their email addresses. I don't know who's read my book. You tell me you've read my book. That's okay, but no one tells me who's read my book. Uh, so I don't have a built-in audience for my next book, but here I have a built-in audience for what I want. So I said, could the future of book writing be this shit? Mm. Okay. Versus book writing. And the speed in which. Like, and, and the speed and the connection and everything yeah, else. And of course, you can, you can add video, you can add all kinds of stuff. All the things. So I said, I better try this. So that was my third step was, okay. So the muscle was, this is different. The learning was, this is Substack. And then it was like, okay, what are you going to do about it, Rashad? You should start a Substack. So what I then did was I said, okay, but I don't want to charge and I don't want to send it randomly to people because they'll be offended. 
So what I did was I said, I'm, I had a compelling name, <coughs> which is the future does not fit in the containers of the past. So I said, I'm going to write a substack called the future does not fit in the containers of the past. It's going to be completely free. If you would like to sign up, please go here and enter your email. And I just put that on LinkedIn and Twitter and Facebook. And, and in two weeks, I had 500 emails, 500 people who had opted in saying, okay, fool, we want to see what experiment you're on. <laughs> okay. So I started writing on August 20th, 2020. Okay, this was pandemic going on, et cetera. So also one of the ways I was trying to figure out how to keep writing when bookstores were closed and everything right, else. Right. So now I have 21,000 subscribers, but because of LinkedIn reposting, republishing about 30,000 readers, a week. I reach more CEOs than Ad Age, Ad Weekend, Campaign Magazine. I still don't charge. There's no advertising. There's nothing. But by doing, I've also built an asset. Yeah. Okay. So I have a, I have a direct relationship where 30,000 people read me every Sunday. Amazing. For six or seven minutes. Mm -hmm. Right. I built an asset. I built a relationship. I built content, which allowed me to sell my second book. Okay. Uh, and a relationship and all those are because I was learning that I did this little, this muscle stuff. Maybe what I know isn't the only thing I should know. Okay. Right. Then I should try this new stuff. Right. And this yeah. is a good story. You know, you could also have bad stories. The good news is I did not put all my money in NFTs and did that. <laughs> I also learned a lot about web three and NFTs. Okay. Yeah, but I didn't go yeah. deep down that hole, uh, <laughs> but I did try a little bit of it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, you know, those are the key things I've learned. I mean, I love it. So, you know, the idea of how staying relevant relevant is both, you know, you're affirming for me that it is both making sure that you're spending time learning, studying, exercising that muscle, putting it into action, and then really seeing what happens. So in your case, as you said, building the sub stack gave you content. Now you have your the outline or more than that for your next book, right? So actually getting that the full feedback loop, which is, I mean, amazing. What I love about your actual, the, the, the book, and I have it both in a hard copy and in Kindle, cause I'm a nerd and I like to read two different ways is I love that. I'm going to call it that your book is a little bit of choose your own adventure in that you can start at any chapter. You could look at the index and see what you want to read about. It's not necessarily needed to be read linearly. What was your inspiration for that? Because I would imagine it's very much like your Substack. You can jump yeah. in on the current newsletter yes. or you can go into the filtering and read three other articles that you've written around the same thing. So here is a key thing. And this is a very hard thing that people don't normally ask. Okay. So once I started writing my book, I asked a question, which is how many copies does a nonfiction business book sell in America? And the answer is <laughs> somewhere between two and 4,000 copies. Wow. Okay. Is some sell 100, 200, obviously some sell 100,000 plus, but people basically sell two to 4,000 copies. And so I basically said, why so little? Hmm. Okay. And the, and I identified three reasons why. So I basically said, I don't want to sell only two to 4,000 copies. So I'm going to do the exact opposite of what everybody else is doing because what they're doing only sells two to 4,000 copies. I didn't <laughs> say I am a better writer. They're all horrible people. I can outright them. I am so good looking. People will buy my book based on my picture. I didn't say any of that. I basically said if the average book is two to 4,000, I'm going to probably sell two to 4,000. Why are they only selling two to 4,000? Now, part of it is maybe they marketed it wrong, et cetera, but it wasn't that. It was the book itself. Mm. So mostly, most nonfiction business books are written for the writer and not for an audience. Okay? They're written so that you can say you have a book because it helps you get speaking engagements. Yes, Okay, because it really helps your speaking engagement. So your whole stuff is like, I'm going to go publish a book. Number one. Number two is most nonfiction business books are self-published and they sell about 500,000 copies, right? So you can self-publish a book. You can go to Amazon, you can go and you publish your own book. And because you publish your own book, there's no quality control. Mm -hmm. 
right? Nobody even, nobody says back like, what are you writing about? And why is this crap working, <laughs> right? But at the very same stage, you don't have any marketing. No yeah. one's going to, there's no bookstores, there's nothing else. Right. But then the third reason, which is the reason that speaks specifically to what you said, is most nonfiction books are one chapter repeated 12 times. <laughs> you can read the first chapter of any nonfiction book and you got it. It's done. You don't have to read the remaining 11. So I'm laughing because again, for our listeners, this like listening to Rashad is bringing me back to when we got to work together, where it was just like pearl of wisdom after pearl of wisdom, where you're like duff factor. And yeah. it would make, always so, make me giggle because it's yeah, so, so true. It was true. So my whole stuff was, okay, Rashad, what are you going to do about this? Okay. Number one, you're going to basically not self-publish clown. You're going to basically go get a real publisher because a real I publisher will have quality that. control. And a real publisher will basically give you editing and then marketing. So I said, okay, cool. Yeah. Number two is you're going to basically write a book where each chapter is its own book. And you're going to write it in such a way that they can read any chapter in any order after they read the introduction. So it's not a book of essays. Like a book of essays is 12 chapters that have nothing to do with each other. Here, there's actually a spine and the spine is that you have to combine the story and the spreadsheet, the left brain and the right brain, the math and the meaning, you know, soul and data, right? That's the spine. But then I visit it in different ways from the area of data to how do you speak truth at meetings to how to upgrade your mental operating system to how to be a better leader. So each of those are different things. And as a result, you know, the book did not sell two to 4,000 copies but has sold over 40,000 copies and still sells about a thousand copies every, you know, about a thousand copies a quarter, sometimes 1500 co copies a quarter, three years out. Amazing. Okay. And, 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 and we're basically, in fact, my publisher says like people don't sell five, 600 copies three years after they've brought a book out every month. In, okay. in a business nonfiction, because you would say- Nonfiction. Oh, and by the way- old. And, it, right. It's and, and, it's, it's, it's not, and, and, so, and by the way, the people who buy it, and sometimes you know, people buy it in a little bit of a scale. So in the month of February, Walmart and P&G between them, that was a good month, bought about 800 copies. Hmm. Okay. Now, part of it is because I went and spoke there, but the reason they wanted to buy the copies is they said, Richard, every chapter in every chapter in this book that was written three years ago could have been written yesterday. Right, right. So I also wrote one of the other things was, by the way, which surprised people when I kept eliminating stuff from my book. I said, no, that will date. So I said, this is too topical. I don't want my book to basically, I said, I will have stories from 20 years ago that don't date, but I don't want to do something which is very, that dates two years from like, or six months yeah. from now, right? So yeah. you want to book this perpetual. So my book actually talked about distributed unbundled work, working from home. It did. Before COVID. <laughs> It's chapter two. So I've talked about AI uh -huh. three and a half years ago, right? Yeah. And it's impact. And, and so now people say, wait, what the shit? How did this happen? <laughs> so now they, you know, so, so it's, it's, it's okay. And I said, because I was trying not to write a loser of a book. Because my whole stuff is, if I want to read a book, what would, what would make me benefit? Well, tell me about the things I'm concerned about, but you don't know all the things I'm concerned about. So make, give me 12 choices. And if I select two or three, it's a great book. But what happens is most people dive into a chapter that they like because they self-select. So you self-select that that chapter is really relevant. So you said, this is cool. So you said, let me try another one, which then they do. And then most people finish the whole book. So yeah. they say, okay, this book is actually good. Let me check what else he's saying in these things, right? Okay. Uh, and, and, and then I've seen books that are like marked up, like they're like some, you know, scratched up dictionaries. People are like underlining. Well, mine has like post-it notes on it. People, and... I see these post-it notes and, 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 and it says sort of prevalent. And, and then I've used some of the learning from the book for my sub stack, right? So very much like in my sub stack, because all the topics, you know, particularly change. But, mm -hmm. you know, when you, when you share the link with, um, your um, guests uh, or your listeners, you know, one of the things that I, uh, that I, that you should share is I follow the same theme without people knowing it in the way I write. So my sub, my sub stack isn't on one topic. So if you know, every week it's different. 
Yes. Right. So what I tell people is if you don't like a particular issue, just wait. Next week will be completely different. It'll be a different topic. <laughs> It'll be completely different. Right. People, uh, he is dropping wisdom for right. any writers out there. Right. So it'll be completely different. And by the way, so it's, 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 it's very, very simple. But this is the key thing. So what I did was a lot of people said you've written, because I've now written 146 weeks in a row. So I've got 146 pieces of writing between 1,000 and 2,000 words. So I've written 200,000 words, which is like four books, right? But a lot of people said, hey, there's so much stuff. How do we find it? Substack's not got a good search engine. So I said, actually, I write about lots of different topics, but they all are about 12 topics, very much like my 12 chapters in my book, but they don't mirror the chapters in my book because this world is different. So I sent you a link of a page where I've taken the best of three years of writing and organized it into 12 sec sections. So, so if someone wants to know about how to grow their career, they can read that. How do you manage culture? You can read that. You know, how, how to think about the future? You can read that. Right. And then I keep this current and updated. So unlike my book, this is my latest thinking. Right. In one place. Now, this, by the way, supports my book. It doesn't compete with my book because when people read this, they go buy the book. People yeah. who buy the book come and look at this. So, again, you know, as a future of marketing, it isn't one or the other. Right. And by the way, let's suppose this was the competition to the future of book. At least I'm writing it versus saying I refuse to not write a book just because I work so hard to sell it. <laughs> right, right. I will drop the link of what Rashad sure. is talking about also in the notes on his um on his sub stack and where you can get those articles. Really, really helpful conversation. Where where I'd love for you to go a little bit deeper is one of the things that I've heard you speak about, you know, within the walls of publicists, and that of course you do have it in your sub stack, is the concept and your book, the concept of the turd on the table. Sure. And I would love you to go into that a little bit because in essence, you know, it is about how how to tell our listeners to become turd slayers, as you would say. Yes, yes. And I think that's really helpful because a lot of us are trying to do what we think is best, but we also want to be respectful and professional to the cultures in which we work in. Yeah. And you have found a way to very definitely navigate that. So, you know, very accomplished individuals, um, and many of your listeners are those accomplished individuals, uh, sometimes have concerns and I, you know, I don't know whether, because I I've seen research that both supports and does not support this thing called imposter syndrome. Right. Uh, so I'm not saying imposter syndrome, but anybody good uh, sometimes wonders whether they're good enough. Right. Or whether they remain relevant, that relevancy thing becomes very important. Yes. And so I've identified two reasons why people are sometimes concerned. OK, one which I write about and I'll just briefly allude to is change. Mm -hmm. Right. And my basic belief is how to manage change. So it sucks less. OK, that I believe change is difficult. So when people say it's easy, I don't think it's easy. OK, it's difficult. Uh, so how do you manage change? But the other one is how do you basically both tell truth to power as well as how do you tell truth to yourself? Mm -hmm. And tell truth to your team and you know, tell truth or the best truth that you know. It may not be truth, but how do you be as authentic and real? And what I found is successful individuals, they are not two different people. They are the same person. Obviously, the way you behave at home is slightly different than the way you behave at the office and you behave with someone else. But if someone basically saw me at work and then saw me at home and saw me on vacation... They'd say it's the same guy, except being, you know, year he's drinking beer all the time. There he's not drinking beer. You know, year he's like reading books. The other place he's giving presentations, but it's the same idiot. Okay. Uh, it's the same thing, same voice. So if you do that, then you actually, that to me is bringing yourself whole self to work, right? Mm -hmm. Not right. It's, it's like being true. And that's where the turd on the table comes in. So what's the concept of the table, which, by the way, is a favorite chapter of both my bosses. So Maurice Levy and Jack Clues. Oh, really? <laughs> like that chapter the best. OK, because it was the one that would upset them the most, too. Uh, <laughs> so it's basically when everyone's sitting around the table in an office or in a meeting and there's something brown and moist on the table and everybody pretends it's a cookie, but everybody knows it's a piece of shit, but nobody says so. Someone's got to basically say, hey, that ain't a brownie. It's a piece of shit. It's a turd on the table. Yeah. 
which is one of the most hardest things for managers, individuals, and people is to basically say, I got myself a problem or we have a problem. Let's talk about the problem versus avoid the problem. When you avoid the problem, two things begin to happen. Three things begin to happen. One is it's very hard to run a good culture because it becomes a culture of fear because it means that no one can speak up. Two, because of that, companies or teams that do that eventually become low performing and sometimes go out of business like or close to Wells Fargo open fake accounts for years. Everybody knew it. You know, Boeing shipped bad software uh, because people couldn't speak up. Right. So that's a way, way to sort of speak up. But the third one is you eventually can't improve because one of the thirds is maybe you're not good enough or you haven't solved the problem or the team isn't addressing the right issue. Right. At which stage you lose your client or you lose your job to somebody who actually does get better. So it's the managing the turd on the table. And that is the thing that we try to hide. So what I tell people is world-class people, world-class companies, and all, I think everybody has the, if they're not world-class, has the capability of being world-class. So everybody who's world-class or has the capability of world-class, the only reason they get defeated is because they defeat themselves. Mm -hmm. And they defeat themselves because they start to believe that their flatulence smells like Chanel 5. <laughs> okay? And that's because their whole stuff is like, I'm farting roses versus turds. Okay? So the whole idea basically is part of it is being able to tell truth to power. And a harder part of it is by looking in the mirror and saying, hey, listen, Rashad, you suck. You better do something about it versus everybody else sucks, which then leads to, you know, my third thing, which is a growth mindset, which is how do you keep learning? Mm -hmm. I love it. I love it. Okay. I'm going to ask you just a couple more questions. Sure. And then before we go, I want you to tell our listeners about your next book. Sure. So my first question for you is what is something that you liked more than you thought you would? So there was, okay. Uh, it's the first thing that I, I liked much more than I thought I would was mathematics mm. only. Okay. Because once I came to do it, I began to realize it was about as close to this weird combination of philosophy and uh, music um, because it's, it's, you know, yeah. Yeah. And, 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 you know, music is basically math allowed. That's the best way of thinking about it. You know, you think about the scales and everything else. So that, that was one. Um, the, the other thing that I discovered that I enjoyed much more than I even thought I would, though I knew I would, which eventually frames my next book is I love working for myself. Mm. Okay. Much more than I thought I would. And by the way, I was one of the five most senior people in a hundred thousand person company. And I worked for two legends who are amazing bosses. So it wasn't that I had bad bosses or bad career or bad everything, right? But my wife was particularly concerned that, what are you going to do? No one's going to talk to you. You're going to be all by yourself. You have no media, no budget, no power, no clients, no nothing. You need a job. <laughs> right? You won't have a job. You're just going to be like useless, you know, like a piece of meat on the street. What the hell are you trying to do this? Because obviously, I started the second career under my own volition, I, yes. You know, I did not have many of us, even today, are like laid off and a whole bunch of other things. Uh, that did not happen to me. I was fortunate. OK, um, but but it happens all the time. Um, mm -hmm. And in my case, I sort of, you know, I built my move because I had this statement that someone told me that every career has a midnight hour and the smart people leave at five to 12. <laughs> OK. Uh, which basically was like, get out of the grocery store before your sell-by date. That's the best <laughs> way of looking at it. And I had seen enough to realize that if you stayed one minute past, you went from being the princess or prince to being a cabbage. Yes. Okay. So, or pumpkin or whatever. So the whole idea is you got to get out of Dodge. So that's what I wanted to get out early when people thought I was still cool, uh, mm -hmm. which is, which was important. And, and therefore I did this and, and my, you know, I said, okay, let's see if it works. Okay. And my whole stuff was like, shit, this is great. This is the way it should be. Okay. Now this takes away nothing from what I did. Right. And I still do a lot of stuff for my old company, but I began to realize that actually the future of work is very different than what we think it is. 
Okay, and that's what I'm writing around about. And my few, my next book is called Rethinking Work. Oh, that's okay. Amazing. And and a lot of advice that I give people uh, broadly because I do not have you know your coaching expertise, and that's not <laughs> my business. But you know, people basically like when I'm they ask me, they said like, "Hey, listen, you seasoned old fellow, like, do you have any advice?" We're like, we've lost a job, we're switching jobs, we're you know do, doing that kind of stuff. Um, so I'm not. You're talking about someone who's working in a company trying to get a higher role, a lot of which you do. This is like, people say, okay, like, what the hell? (laughs) Like, I don't like this job or like, I don't have a job. What do I do about it? Okay. So in in there is where I came up with this particular, and I've been thinking about it. And my stuff is maybe it's exactly that, that we're thinking jobs when we should be thinking work. Mm. Right. Can you share what that means to you? So the difference between work and jobs is jobs are roles to fill and things to be done. Work is a way of being and problems to be solved. Right. And too often we're hiring for jobs versus like solve the goddamn problem. Right. And, And so I began to sense the following. And some of this is somewhat scary. And now having done this for a while, it's not that scary, but initially, and, and I was in a position where I could take this, you know, this jump because I didn't, if I fell, I'd be okay. I had enough of a trampoline and things like that, but not, most people don't. So I understand that. But even then, here's what the key is. The first thing that I, I began to realize is that everybody is going to be a gig worker. Okay. Uh, that that right. there are no jobs, there are just assignments. Yes. And and so people said, Rishal, are you telling us the future is being a task rabbit and an Uber driver and things like that? I said, no, 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 that's one part of the jobs. But let's say you were basically in Hollywood before the writer's strike, okay? How do people in entertainment work? They work around gigs. Yeah. This movie, this television show, this production. And with How each gig, they might work slightly differently to the next gig. They take right. their competency and what's yeah. slightly how, how do consultants work even if you have a career at Bain McKinsey or right you go from every six months you go to a different thing but what you are known for is expertise network reputation and continuous learning hmm. right. so I said think about yourself even if you're in a full-time company and I said I managed to survive not survive thrive in a company for 37 years because I had a gig like mindset it wasn't like, okay, I'm here and I'm not going to retire in the next five years. I don't do anything. That wouldn't have worked. Okay. So I had a, and so I'm not suggesting that people leave companies. I stayed in the same company, but I'm basically saying you have to have this gig mindset. The other one, we're going to work alongside machines. So it's us plus machines, not us versus machines or machines right. only. Right. right. Uh, and then the third one, which becomes very, very, very sort of important is we might have multiple, we might have portfolio careers much faster than we think. So here's a a statistic in my book, which is quite surprising. Two statistics. One is in the U.S., the U.S. number, 60, in almost all the jobs that were created between 2020 and now, net new jobs are in companies with less than 300 people. Mm. So it doesn't mean large companies aren't hiring people, but large companies are firing people faster than they're hiring people. Right. Middle companies are about the same, but the small companies are hiring many more people. And there are lots of reasons for it, including technology, you know, all kinds of other stuff. That's number one. The second is Gen Z, which is 18 to 34 year olds. 66% of Gen Z people who have a full-time job also have a side gig, side hustle or passion project running. Right. Right. 76% of Gen Z want to work for themselves and be their own boss. Right. Okay. And that is the mindset. And now you consider unbundled distributed work where anyone can work from anywhere. So, you know, like, here's what a CEO told me. He says, Rishad, I know you're very cool about like everybody can work anywhere. I said, yep. And he says, you know, that means I can also hire anybody from anywhere. So I said, yeah. So he says, that means I could hire someone from a different city. So I said, if it's good for your business and the person does a good job, why not? Right. Uh, so companies are going to increasingly re-aggregate teams. They're going to be working like production studios and consulting companies. They're not going to basically say, yeah, you have a job for the next two years, you do this and your job is guaranteed. Right. Now, once you start thinking in that mindset, that mindset is no different than basically being an entrepreneur. That's what I was. I was not an entrepreneur, but I was inside a company as an entrepreneur. 
So my basic belief is you have to take control your own destiny, right? And, 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 and whether you're working in a company of one or hundreds of thousands, control your own destiny. Do not outsource your future to the HR department or to your boss. That's what, it regards how amazing your bosses are. And I have the best bosses, okay, who I keep talking to and who are so concerned that I will fall, fall flat on my face, they still give me gigs, okay? That, that's how <laughs> concerned that, that I'm a loser. But just so, you know, you know. Yeah. But I also think to your point, the, the other thing I would add on is that, you know, my grandmother in March just turned 100. Okay, so yes. she's working, but... We're also living longer. So this idea that we might stop working at some point in our 60s, I think work will look differently, but that we're not necessarily sitting around for 30 years, quote, retired, right? You may take a pause for a year. You may come back and do a different thing. Like I do completely support that idea of that. It's a gig mentality into this. So tell yes. us when, when does the next book come out? Well, assuming that everything works according to plan, which is the book, I finished the book by the end of the year, that uh, McGraw-Hill, who's my publisher, does a projectile vomit over it, which I don't think they will, because I sent them the first three chapters and they did not say cease and desist. So, <laughs> uh, so assuming, assuming, that, that, assuming that that all basically sort of works, um, I would say that uh, it'll be fall of 2024. Okay. Uh, so it's still about a year away. Uh, and the reason is because after you finish the book for these big publishers, you said six months editing, proofreading, line editing, fact checking. Uh, and and that's when it will basically come out. But you know, to get not the book, but to get some feelings of it, it's just to read the stuff like in the, this particular link about the future right. of work. I have a section, right? Yes. Or just to read my sub stack. So in fact, my most recent piece is a subset of the chapter I'm, I just finished writing. Okay. okay. Because once in a while, when I have nothing to write on my sub stack, I go steal stuff from the past. Okay. <laughs> because I have to write every week. Right. Uh, and the good news is I'm writing a lot of new stuff. So I said, okay, I'll take this and put that out there as a, as a key thing. I love it. Well, we will have to have you back when that next book comes out. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. But thank you for having me. Thank you so much. I mean, so many gems of wisdom. And, you know, I know this is definitely one that people are going to listen to with their notes app open and be writing down the various pearls. And I really thank you for sharing your expertise with everyone today. Welcome. Thank you. Talk to you soon. Bye. Bye. Hey, thanks for listening to the Career Refresh Podcast. If you're enjoying this and you want more information, go to my website, jillgriffincoaching.com. There you can find information on how to work with me one-on-one -on -one or my group programs, or even bring me into your workplace. I'll put the link to my website in the show notes. But hey, listen, before you go, do me a favor, rate and review this podcast because it definitely helps me get the word out to people everywhere so that they can also thrive in the workplace. All right, friends, I appreciate you. I'll see you soon. Thank you.